Welcome everybody to Falling Through the Cracks. Implications, can we have the next slide before that? Implications of AI on employment for individuals with disabilities. First, some housekeeping items. This webinar is being recorded. We will post an archive of this webinar and transcript to the Kessler Foundation website. I'd like to thank the University of New Hampshire, our partners in the production of National Trends in Disability Employment Monthly Jobs Report for providing our technical assistance for today's webinar. There are instructions on the screen to activate closed captioning and adjust any sound changes. Our live sign language interpreter should appear on your screen. Please email us through the Q&A box for any technical issues. Please also click on the Q&A box to ask questions during the webinar. Questions may be answered during the webinar directly in the Q&A box, or may be saved for a Q&A section at the end of the webinar. If you have any questions following the webinar, please contact us at kfgrantprogram at kesslerfoundation.org. That's kfgrantprogram at kesslerfoundation.org. Next slide, please. Again, welcome to our annual grantee symposium, our first virtual program. I'm Elaine Katz, Senior Vice President of Grants and Special Initiatives at Kessler Foundation. Our grantee symposium is a yearly opportunity to bring together grantees and guests to hear from subject matter experts about key issues related to the employment of individuals with disabilities. Now the pandemic has given us a unique opportunity to bring this program online to a national audience. We hope it is the first of a series of thought provoking disability issues webinars. For those of you who are not familiar with Kessler Foundation, we change the lives of people with disabilities through medical rehabilitation research and funding employment initiatives for individuals with disabilities. Our rehabilitation research seeks to improve cognition and mobility for individuals with disabilities such as spinal cord injury, traumatic brain injury, and multiple sclerosis. We also look to improve daily functioning and in promote independence by testing new interventions and gathering data that can be used in treatment. Our Center for Grant Making has invested close to $49 million over the past 13 years in our three programs, both in New Jersey and nationally. Our targeted grant making has supported new business ventures, job development, job creation in various sectors across the United States. But most importantly, we're the leading funder of innovative approaches that can affect systematic changes by creating genuine economic opportunities for individuals with disabilities. Today's symposium is on the future of work and the influence of artificial intelligence on employment for individuals with disabilities. Artificial intelligence or AI is not commonly a subject that you hear discussed by professionals at mainstream disability organizations. However, the use of automation continues to grow and influence employee recruitment and placement systems, but all too often, fails to reflect the rich cultural diversity and differences of our lives. Why is this topic so important to the disability community and its allies? Digital technology is increasingly central to employment training, placing, onboarding, and maintaining employment. This automation and digitalization can create new technological and diversity disparities within our communities. The COVID pandemic has simply accelerated the use of artificial intelligence and algorithm as our society fully embraces virtual education, training, and employment. We hope that this symposium today will help you recognize what the future of work may look like and the influence of AI on employment. It will further lead you to better your understanding and preparation for the upcoming shifts in how we work, where we work and the online systems facilitating these processes for employment. Next slide, please. So we wanna welcome our first speaker today who's going to be speaking on the future of work, setting the stage for employment and the evolution of corporate culture. Jonathan Kaufman is an innovative thought leader, 
business educator, and strategist who recognized the impact of personal development on organizational growth. Many may know him as an advocacy, an advocacy, an advocate rather, and a frequent contributor to Forbes.com online. Jonathan, take it away. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm glad to see you. And, you know, today I want to sort of present a global look. And one of the most important things that sort of comes to mind is anyone who knows me is that I'm influenced by a ninth century philosopher by the name of Sadia Gaon. And he always said, the question is often more important than the answer. So in anything that you learn today or take from this um, uh, seminar today is that I want you to ask questions. And so that's where I'll begin. And if we can have the next slide. Okay, so in the time that we have, I just wanna focus on a few themes and I'm gonna sort of put my anthropologist hat on. And it's important to understand that the definition of a corporation has been changing drastically and particularly in this time of COVID-19. I mean, we're sort of going through a maelstrom of, and, it, and it seems to be just a horrible time, yet the nature of work has, has been changing at an accelerated rate. And we have an opening now for persons with disabilities to redefine themselves and redefine how they look within the world of work. And no more is this sort of, I think, more applicable than in the area of remote work. And we have to see a place and almost seize this moment to say that, the, that we in the disability community can actually have a place and a moment and have true value. So it's really important in this time and particularly for corporations themselves to say, okay, we understand and we have begun to understand the value proposition of employees with disabilities. But now that we're sort of moving into this next phase where the nature of work is changing, where we work, how we work, when we work, is so important and this provides a moment where persons with disabilities can have tremendous value and almost be create a sort of parity where this is a time where we can find our place in the world of work. So the questions that I have here again are so important. And when you go back to your organizations, you can certainly use these because it's important that you ask. So, Let's go to the next slide because I think it's important that we discuss this. And so um, as I began to sort of talk about this, you know, over the past decade, there has been a seismic shift. And obviously technology has been one of the galvanizing forces. And it's important to sort of put this in perspective. So, you know, there was a, a study done by sort of Zion Marketing Research. And one of the things that they talked about was that there is a true monumental change in the purchase and uh, particularly the, the purchase and acquisition of adaptive technology. And whether we're talking about sort of low tech to more high tech, which is which has sort of become, I think, part of the process these days. In 2015, the amount of money that was spent on adaptive tech reached about $14 billion. And right now, according to their studies, they say by 2026, adaptive technology, the market itself will be anywhere between 26 and $31 billion. So if we understand the trajectory, tr the true trajectory of where adaptive tech is going, we only see it going upwards. And, in the, and as we're sort of seeing the world of COVID has been this accelerant, the need for adaptive technology has begun to sort of at least grow at a faster rate. And it's important that when companies think about their 
diversity and inclusion strategy. And they look at sort of the world of disability, you know, employees with disabilities and that sort of business milieu and understanding, okay, what do we need to think about? This is an area that I think will continue to grow and the value proposition of persons with disabilities will then continue to grow as well. It, it sort of goes hand in hand um, and it's important. But I also wanna step back for a moment and think about it more from a, as, as I say, sort of philosophical viewpoint. So you have two major organizations in the past, I'd say between 2018 and 2019, one here in the United States, which is the Business Roundtable, which is as I sort of write here, it's an association of CEOs in America, but then there's sort of the global landscape and that is the World Economic Forum. And so between 2018 and 2019, they began to think about what is the purpose of a corporation? And how do we redefine a corporation? If we can go to the next slide, that would be great. And each one of them, both the Business Roundtable and the World Economic Forum said, we have to move beyond the idea of um, Milton, the economist Milton Friedman's idea that a company is truly just about shareholder value and expand it to understand that no, companies are about their people. You know, um, I always think about my grandfather who was a business owner and he used to say that the essence of business is about the people that work there. That makes the culture. So it's real, and so both the business, the sort of business round table and the World Economic Forum within the past, literally the past two years, um, have redefined sort of the modern principles of what a corporation is. And, and sort of here's a quote specifically from the Business Roundtable, which says sort of major employers are investing in their workers and communities because they know it is the way to be successful over the long term. These modernized principles reflect the business community's unwavering commitment to push the economy that serve all Americans. The idea of highlighting sort of diversity and inclusion is fundamental. And when I sort of think about the disability community, one of the things I tell my clients, I tell my students, I tell anyone I can, I can sort of at least will listen is that disability is the essence of diversity. It runs across race, ethnicity, gender, socioeconomics, sexual orientation. It is, and it's the only minority group anyone can join at any time. It is the essence of diversity and it is part, truly part of the human experience. So it's as we sort of think about the redefinition of a company, that is, is fundamental. And I'll sort of go even go a neck, another step. When we think about the definition of a corporation, we have to think about the disability narrative. Anybody who knows me and knows my work, I have been writing about this you know, ad nauseum in the sense that for corporations to think about how they do business in the 21st century, it is essential that they understand that there, that there is a new disability narrative that can help define management practice and essentially business practice for the 21st century. They have to look at the disability experience and say, okay, how do we understand that disability offers a way for creative thinking, new management practice, new ways to think about the world of work in general. I don't have enough time to sort of get into the sort of minutia of that. And I'm certainly happy to answer some of those questions. But I think in terms of modernizing the principles um, of a 21st century corporation, we have to look into the lived experience as a body of knowledge just as much as it is about the lived experience in terms of personhood and agency. 
And that's going to be really important when we sort of think about highlighting disability in the economy of the 21st century. So if we can go to the next slide, that would be great. And so, okay, you know, COVID has been awful. You know, it, we're sort of stuck in this maelstrom as all of us, you know, we're, we're online literally here. And many of us are sort of stuck inside and certainly we're heading into a winter where there are gonna be tremendous spikes and we're all seeing the numbers. And, but, but what the silver lining of the COVID era has allowed us to, to witness is it's as sort of Elaine talked about, it's been an accelerant and it's been an accelerant for um, sea level executives, um, entrepreneurs, um, management to sort of say, okay, we are now forced to rethink the very nature of work and how we work. You know, so, and, you know, at this point, we've seen that prior to, you know, COVID-19 companies have already begun to move away from sort of centralized workspaces. And now they're at a point where there isn't wiggle room to say, okay, we do this or we don't do this. We have to do this to survive. Um, and it's really important because this gives an opening for people with disabilities to be engaged in the process of work and be, and almost as I said before, to sort of be on par if they're given the tools. And it allows businesses to sort of say, oh, we can see disabilities in people with disabilities rather in all different types of roles if they're given the tools that allow them in. So it's really important to, I think, when sort of COVID is over, but even in this moment, to see what is the importance that remote work has provided for this community? And how do we understand this new relationship? Because I think, as I mentioned before, when we look at the sort of 21st century understanding of a corporation, there has to be a fundamental change in terms of employee-employer relationship. And one of the, the models that I sort of go to um, is Reid Hoffman's idea. And Reid Hoffman was the, he's a, a partner at, at Greylock Partners and one of the co-founders of LinkedIn. And he wrote a wonderful book several years ago called The Alliance. And it's the idea that the sort of employee-employer relationship is changing. It is not a top-down re relationship. It actually is a conversation. And one of the most important things that we have to think about, particularly now in the COVID era, is the conversation between employees with disabilities as well as well, th that conversation with companies and particularly senior management within the company, um, C-level executives and say, we need each other and the relationship has to change. And I think it's important that we stress that relationship because it changes the tenor of the nature of work and how we work. And once we're sort of past COVID, and we will get past it. I know sometimes it's hard to think that, um, or how long this will be, but, but we will have that moment where we cross that, the sort of cross the Rubicon, you know, and, and say we pass this and say, well, how is work change? And what remains, you know, what vestiges of the old model of work, the, the sort of current model of work, that we're utilizing during COVID and what can we utilize in the, the work of the 21st century in a decentralized um, environment, which all, and, and we have to sort of look at this community as a way to be, in many ways, I think, can be a template and can offer a template because change um, is, is such a key part um, and having that agility is such a key part of the lived experience of disability and it's so important. All right, if we could go to the next slide, that would be great. Okay, so I asked this question, where do we go from here? 
And, and, I, and again, sort of COVID-19 has forced corporate culture to wrestle with new challenges. And I, I sort of explained some of those challenges, but I, again, there are going to be challenges. Um, and I think the big underlying one is sort of a decentralized, the idea of a, an office space has changed, the physical office space to a virtual office space. How are we going to wrestle with that? That's gonna be really interesting. Um, and the, the second one is how employees, with how employees with disabilities must redefine their perception and value. Now, it isn't just about an understanding from sort of the, the corporate side, whether that's C-level executive, senior management on down, but it is in, incredibly important for, for employees with disabilities to take the reins. And, and one of the areas I think that's in, incredibly vital in this process are employee resource groups. They have a moment now where they can take a leadership um, approach to how they envision themselves within the context of corporate life, as well as DNI professionals, diversity and inclusion professionals, and even talent management professionals. But I think it's important and that persons with disabilities, particularly employees with disabilities in any company, say, how do we want to be seen? How do we want to be viewed? And also the value proposition that we can provide to our org to the organization we work in. And so these are questions that will sort of continue to be something that needs to be magnified and clarified and cultivated as going forward. And sort of the third one here is corporate leadership can use this moment to see the importance of the lived experience of disability as a tool for the culture and reinvention in this new digital economy. I go back to the idea that the disability experience can be monumental in reshaping how corporate culture evolves. And one, you have to see it as this experience offers a body of knowledge, whether it's how do you link it to an idea of creative thinking? How do you link it to a evolution of new products and services and marketplace. You can link it to the idea that now you have a whole new talent pool that needs to be considered. Um, and again, I, I, I can go into this in more detail, but I just sort of giving you the 10,000 foot view. It's important to understand that we are now at a true inflection point. Um, technology allows tremendous freedom. Um, but again, I go back to this idea that the access to the types of technology and the, the sort of adaptive technology, we understand, as I mentioned before, the marketplace, but now it's the application. Application, ap my, my thesis, my doctoral thesis advisor used to say in his French accent, application, application, application. So it's critical that we think about what are the next steps in terms of application of the disability experience within the corporate milieu? And how do we do that? That I think is gonna be absolutely fundamental. I think we have another slide. No, uh, that, that's the last slide. That and is that, it. that Jonathan provides a perfect segue into um, Betsy's presentation. Um, so Betsy is going, so we've kind of set the stage for you on the future, what it may look like um, in this COVID pandemic. And um, Betsy is going to talk about, are people with disabilities falling through the crack? Uh, Betsy is the CEO of Benetech, a nonprofit that empowers communities with software for social good in education, poverty, alleviation, and human rights. Betsy has been an advocate for ethical and inclusive technology for over a decade and is focused on innovating around the immense potential of technology to drive inclusion, equity, and justice to positively impact marginalized communities across the globe. Betsy, welcome you to our symposium.
Thanks so much, Elaine. And it's so great to hear Jonathan talk about possibilities. And from Elaine's introduction of me, you can tell that that's how I spend most of my focus. At the same time, I'm an engineer. We're technology people and we're using AI and other technologies every day on the positive side. But I'm going to focus a bit today on how people with disabilities today are falling through the cracks because of some of these same really promising technologies. So if you go to the next slide. So first message is AI is, is here now and it's everywhere. So I, some people think about AI as something in the future and I'll say AI is artificial intelligence. Um, I'm gonna short, shorthand that a lot during this presentation. Um, this, this slide is something called the AI 100. It's one version of many uh, groups who are saying by different industries, what are some of the up and coming leaders in AI software? Uh, the main point of it is that whether you're talking about agriculture, auto, government, media, legal, or human resources, um, AI is here it's prevalent and it's, it's being used uh, very regularly. I think if I were to start with a story, uh, you know, you may, you may think about where, where is it used? Where do I see it? Well, you see it if you hear anything or see any self-driving cars. Um, if you use any home assistant that you talk to, um, which I can't even say out loud because then it'll answer me. Um, and you see it in other ways that might be, be harder to, to realize. Um, I use a lot of Microsoft Office products and recently my Microsoft to-do had a new, new item in my to-do list that I didn't put in there and my human assistant didn't put in there. I realized that it automatically put it in there based on the wording in one of the emails I received. It knew, and it was right, by the way, that I had an action on that email and it was starting to be able to say, hey, we can actually be your assistant. And that's all because of artificial intelligence. Um, it's very good at making decisions with lots of data. And you know, there are different, different elements. And I'm not gonna make this a technical discussion about machine learning and machine vision and stuff, but suffice it to say that AI is very good at recognizing patterns in data, in pictures, in you know, lots of lots of different areas that that it can crunch. And that's where when people talk about employment and some of the challenges where AI, you know, is it coming for our jobs? Well, it, it is coming for some. Um, things like x-ray technicians or you know, if you're interpreting MRIs, actually machines can do that really well because it can, if there's enough data about lots of MRIs, it can then compare those and say, ah, here's how this one fits. And it's not perfect uh, by any means, but it will keep learning. That's what's really interesting and why it's sort of called artificial intelligence is because it actually learns as it goes. Um, I'll talk about later how that can bring some problems because if it keeps learning from data, is it learning the wrong lessons in some cases? So why don't you go ahead and advance the slide. So much of what I'll focus on today, given um, what much of you do, is, is talk about really how that manifests in, in human resources and in recruiting kinds of areas for people with disabilities. So, so first, how is AI showing up in the recruiting world really everywhere again? Um, so if you just look at sourcing, screening, and onboarding as three key areas, um, it is already being used in sourcing resumes, in looking at candidate profiles, um, you know, basically, again, sifting through large sets of data that exist in applicant tracking systems or other online databases, and basically saying, okay, you are looking for certain characteristics. How do those characteristics map to jobs? Um, the other area is screening. So, okay, so we're, we can crunch through a bunch of the data. Well, now how do you pick candidates? So, you know, really looking at 
a, a set of evaluation criteria and then evaluating the candidates, but then evaluating the actual candidates through things like video screening. Um, and we're gonna talk about that a bunch because that's a huge issue for people with disabilities. Um, Again, great that you don't have to maybe go into an office and a whole other set of interviews, but what is it that that machine is looking for and do your candidates have it is kind of where we're going to come down on a lot of these questions. And finally, onboarding. Um, you know, there's some real benefits to a human resources department if policies, documents, you know, having lots of resources for a new employee to be able to, you know, they're using a lot of chat bots, for example, to say, oh, the new employee has questions. You know, we don't have time to have somebody, have them shadow somebody for their whole first month. So let's also give them this, this place they can ask questions. Again, some of these, I mean, you can imagine why in recruiting this would be really helpful because there is a lot of volume of data to deal with. There's a lot of matching to deal with that's important. And on the on the slide, I'm, I'm showing a few um, examples, and this is just a few examples of tools, things like Eightfold AI, Textio, Fetcher, those are all kind of in the sourcing area. Um, you have a number of tools in the screening area. And again, I'm showing a few like My Interview, Higher View, Yellow, higher twal, which I'm not sure I'm even pronouncing correctly, Zor. So there's a bunch of screening tools. And then there are some in the onboarding area like My Ally or Keo. And again, this is a tiny snapshot of a number of the tools that exist. Um, so go ahead and, and advance the slide. So I, I ended up as I was looking around out there saying, you know, how have things advanced since I last, you know, dove into this area? Um, one of the companies that came up a bunch, and it's not surprising because they're big, is McDonald's. Um, so just as a kind of an overview to give you an idea of how a large company is, is currently like deep in this area, uh, McDonald's either is using or has tried in the last couple of years um, writing recruiting emails and job posting with something called Textio. And, and in this case, um, their approach and their reasoning was really positive. They said, we want to remove gender bias language in our actual job postings so that it's you know, going to attract more, more women. Um, you can see where, again, there's some really good um, reasons that people have for trying to use these tools. Um, they also do candidate screening. So they've, they've actually pulled in a few different tools in that area, something called Paradox that does natu natural language processing. So this would mean I could talk to a machine and it could actually screen me and the, the machine would help crank through that. Um, something called Talk Push, where you have a chat bot, which again is typically kind of a text messagey sort of thing. But again, they can also be voice and you would actually have a conversation with a machine. Um, it may be already, and it certainly will get to where you don't know you're having a conversation with a machine. You could actually think it's a human. Um, begin a job application by voice. So if you have an Alexa, a Google Home, um, they want to make it really easy for somebody to just say, Alexa, start my job application at McDonald's. Again, you can see lots of advantage for job seekers as well as recruiters. Behavioral assessments. This is where things, as we'll see, start to get even trickier. So if you actually say that they're going to put employees through a video game like assessment to see if they're suited to be an employee, um, that is going to work really well for some people and really not so well for others. And video interviews, uh, McDonald's is again um, down the path with something called My Interview, where it would be sort of like I'm doing now, staring at a camera and am I engaged with the camera? How am I relating? Um, again, we're gonna get to, to thinking through what that looks like for somebody with a disability. Um, the, the part I'm not talking a lot about, but of course McDonald's is one of the groups doing a lot of this is how can they use machines and artificial intelligence to 
essentially replace what some humans are doing now. Now, most, most companies will say it is about augmenting, and, and I think often it is, right? You could actually get lots more cars through the drive through if you had machines doing part of it. Um, McDonald's is already uh, looking at showing menus differently based on the weather, the time of day. So, you know, why bother showing the breakfast menu first if it's 10 at night? Somebody could get the breakfast menu, but maybe that's not the first thing they want to see. Um, you know, could the drive through or even the whole store become 100% AI driven? Maybe. Um, wouldn't be great for human contact, but you could potentially reduce the number of humans. So, so I mean, that's my um, prognosticating, not something that they're actually doing to my knowledge, but it is something to just keep in mind that, that again, these these uh, technologies are great and are real. Um, so next slide. So I've already kind of tipped my, my hat here a little bit um, um, with things can go wrong in that. And particularly where they can go wrong is with anybody who's not in the kind of center norm of a sort of curve of data. So, so the key thing about artificial intelligence is data. Um, I always say AI eats data for lunch. So you, you don't get an algorithm that does all these whiz bangy things out the other side if you don't have data that it's learning from. So what and who is in that data is the big question. And I think what we know as a field globally today is people with disabilities are really poorly represented in data sets, definitely in the employment sector for reasons that I think most of you know, um, and really across the board. So, so that means that the, again, the food that these machines are eating doesn't actually have that nutrient in it. So it's a bit of garbage in garbage out. So companies may think, well, we've got this great data set of past employees that have been successful at this company. But if none of those were people with disabilities, then that's just missing. Um, so that's a real issue. The, the other area is what about the developers? You know, who, who's developing these algorithms? Because to a great degree, the machine is actually learning a lot on its own, but it is guided by who is on the development team and certainly who's on the testing team. Um, are they even thinking about people with disabilities? What, what we find is that mostly when people talk about diversity and inclusion initiatives, like Jonathan mentioned, they are mostly talking about race and gender, not so much disability. Um, so again, if even when a company is being very progressive and doing a great job of having their DNI initiatives influence their technology development or on the other side, technology purchases, this whole area may be missing. Um, and then finally, it's back to that technology purchases. The customers, so if I'm in a human resources department and I'm buying some of these tools, um, do I actually know what they're doing? Do I actually know if they are including people with disabilities, if they're including women? Do I? Do I ask? Um, and if I ask, do I get an answer? And does the developer fully know? And that's what, what we have found to be a little uh, disconcerting is that some of the developers will, will either say it's a black box and we can't tell you, or they'll just sort of throw up their hands a bit and say, you know, that's, it is what it is. Uh, or I don't, you know, I don't really know. So uh, next slide. So let's talk about, again, the recruiting piece really specifically. Um, so sourcing, you know, will your candidate's profile match the data of past employees? Um, maybe, uh, but maybe not. You know, if, if you're trying to get somebody in a company that doesn't have a strong past of employing people in wheelchairs or people who are blind, um, are, are they actually there? Um, and if they're not, then those algorithms are not going to be looking for your clients. They're going to be looking for other people that kind of fit that norm center of who they've had before. Um, at the top of the screen, um, this is actually a, a headline, a news headline that, that this is from a few years ago. Amazon 
scrapped at the time, a secret AI recruiting tool that showed bias against women. I mean, that got big headlines because basically their software that they were using ranked certain words, phrases, and activities higher or lower based on language. So what it turned out is that a lot of this was looking at masculine language usage and women were getting pushed to the side. So you can, again, imagine where that goes when you're talking about actual activities and things. If they're looking for sports or something like that because their past best salespeople have played water polo, um, that's an issue. And again, they may not even be doing it on purpose. It may just be, oh, this is great. It's eliminating bias because people are out of the equation. Well, they're not because the data is, is what's driving it. Um, on the screening side, I think this is one of the ones that's gotten the most attention in the disability community is, you know, if I'm here in front of a video camera, which I agree with Jonathan, I think actually more people with disabilities will be getting more used to doing, but that still doesn't mean that if I'm blind or if I'm on the autism spectrum that I am necessarily engaging with that camera in a way that the machine would believe is positive based on the data set it's using. Um, then there's also the speech recognition. I mentioned that some of these tools are literally to have a conversation. And if someone's speech is harder to recognize or again, doesn't match the way that that system was trained to listen, um, that will be a problem. And this has been an issue already shown up with people with different accents um, and again, different speech patterns. So somebody who's deaf or hard of hearing may have a, a really hard time getting past an interview if that's the step they have to go through. And onboarding, you know, there, I think there are probably more advantages in some of these areas than, than the others, but at the same time, wow, if, if the onboarding is essentially like a video game, how, how does that work for everyone? And is that video game being essentially tested on people with disabilities? Are some of the people in the development group saying, oh, wait a minute, you know, if you have it work like this, it's gonna be very inaccessible. Um, and, you know, finally, if it's a text chat bot or voice, again, there may be actual advantages for some people with disabilities and there's gonna be disadvantages for lots of others. Um, so next slide. What should we do about it? Um, well, um, another headline is bias in AI, a problem recognized but still unresolved. So there's a lot of work to be done. Um, one of the areas is inclusive data. So I've talked a lot about the data. So one area that we're working on and a number of others are is how do we make sure people with disabilities are in the data set? And, you know, I'm thinking this whole field needs to be thinking about this and saying, well, maybe some of the people listening to this webinar could actually help with that. Um, maybe there's a way to, to make sure that data sets we have that show robust performance by people with disabilities in various kinds of jobs could find its way into some of the data sets used to train these systems. Um, inclusive development teams, I've mentioned a number of times, you know, people with disabilities need to actually be developers of some of this AI. And at the very least, need to be one of the groups that are seen as testers. And so if you're testing on a group of employees um, or an industry, that industry and group of employees should be representative of the world that we're trying to get into jobs. So, so and again, I think a lot of times there's pains being taken now on diversity and inclusion initiatives on race and gender, not so much disability. And it's engaged community. I think you know, many of you getting a seat at the table, working with employers to think hard about what platforms they're adopting and what the downside risk could be. Um, all of that together, doing all of that will lead to inclusive algorithms. Um, and you know, one, one note on some of these algorithms is some of the companies like I showed Pymetrics on there, um, they've actually come out and said they have an open source algorithm auditing tools. So it's they're actually being much more open and transparent about, hey, you can see if our 
if our algorithm actually is discriminatory or not. And, and that kind of move is really, really important. There's some you know, potential uh, legal things um, around that. Europe has already taken big moves in algorithmic transparency and the US has talked about it, but, but hasn't really quite gotten there yet. So um, there are things we can do about it. The first is recognizing that AI is here and it's real and we have to deal with it. And the second is, is then thinking through where can where where along the line can we fix some things rather than just throw up our hands and i think it is quite fixable um, so together we can get the benefits of ai while supporting the people with disabilities around the world who need these things to include them so thank you And you can see Betsy's information on the screen if any of you have some follow-up questions. Um, we're gonna open it up for some questions now. I'm gonna ask Jonathan to turn back on his video and his audio. Um, so um, we do have some questions in the chat box, which um, actually may be, uh, first one may be more for Jonathan, but you both can have a shot at it. Um, I'm worried that corporate leadership might take wrong lessons from COVID as far as accommodating people with disabilities is considered. Rather than focusing on the disability experience, there's a risk that the leadership might use work from home as an accommodation measure, which might not work for many people with disabilities. Please disabuse me of, um, of this cynicism. Well, it's an, it's an interesting sort of perspective. And I would say that the potential is there. However, I think it is important to show, and this is why I say the conversation is so necessary, that people within the community, as well as ERG groups, as well as people in the, you know, specifically within DNI, to show the value proposition. That is where the conversation has to begin. And so, as we come out of COVID, and I know it, we're not quite there yet, this conversation has to start happening now. Um, and if it begins now, and I think if people within the community are vocal and say, here's what we can provide, here's what this sort of decentralized um, moment has allowed us to do, to, and has allowed us to be more productive and has allowed us to be engaged in the experience of working for an organization and increased productivity. That I think can sort of temper some of the fears. Now, again, I have to say, this conversation has to happen now. And I am having this conversation literally with companies all over the place. So I think that is critical. Uh, I can't have say no direct... cynicism yet, but we'll try. So it's important to have these open conversations, mm -hmm. um, both if you're helping people, if you're working on the side of practitioners, helping people seek employer, or you're one of those who may be working for the employer side on um, you know, the demand side to work with employers to, to keep diversity and inclusion and all these discussions. Um, right in the discussions. Um, I want to move on to the next question so we can try to get some of these in. Um, this is from Vidya Sundar. I heard that some large warehousing companies screen using automated phone calls, which may ne negatively impact people with hearing impairments. Do you know of any solutions that can circumvent these calls? Maybe you might know, Betsy. There's anything yeah. that help people with hearing impairments. Yeah, I, um, I can't really answer it in terms of a technical solution, but I think it goes back to all the stuff that I said about, you know, people need to raise raise up and say, that's not okay. Like we have to make sure that there is that ability for somebody with a hearing impairment to successfully interact with these systems. So, I mean, certainly there are, there are the kind of solutions that help somebody with a hearing impairment communicate on a phone call. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think it's, it's making sure that the employers, again, using these tools really understand that they are actually discriminating when they do that. Um, and that, that yes, there are some technology solutions to make, to make it easier for somebody with a hearing impairment on a phone call, but 
either you have to be able to go around that technology so that you know they're not required to use that particular screening tool, um, which again could lead to concerns about discrimination itself, or just say like you like these got to get out of the system until there's a full end to end ability for all people to use it. So I just want to follow up on that question, because one of the questions I had is how, how if you're a person with a disability or representing a person with a disability and you find you're you're facing this AI, how do you recommend or what do you recommend to how to deal with it to try to still get that job interview or get into the company? Yeah, and, and it's it's again, it's tricky because it is so under recognized, right? Um, there are a number of organizations who are working on more inclusive AI, and it kind of gets to, I think, one of the, the questions later. Um, most of these now are currently kind of in the academic and nonprofit world. Um, there's a group, the Center for Democracy and Technology, who is really looking at this area. They more look at um, examining some of what is being done um, by creators of the technology um, to at least say like, you guys are, you know, here's where you, you need help. Um, there's a group out of UC Berkeley, the Alliance for Inclusive AI, but again, their inclusion is almost entirely women and racial minorities at this point. Um, so, so I think at the large end, it's a growing concern. I mean, I'm uh, groups like Microsoft actually are pushing really hard to fund more groups to get on top of this. So I think, I think there's, there's a big movement at that level. As an actual individual and getting into a specific company, um, I think it's back to saying like, this is discriminatory. I, you know, I'm, I'm sorry to say that there probably need to be some more lawsuits uh, or you know, legal action if employers continue to use these tools. I, th I think though, again, I'll caution to say, I don't actually think a lot of employers know that they're discriminating. Um, they, they, you know, they're adopting tools that they don't understand either. And so I think the first step is awareness and to, to, to squawk about it, frankly. And then you know, if they don't fix it, then you know, there may have to be legal remedies and that's you know, not my area of expertise, but I know some people whose area of expertise it is. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to insert one of my own questions in here because I know there's a lot of people who are listening to this who are not um, placing people in corporations or dealing with large companies. So I'm going to ask both of these questions. But first, Jonathan, how 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 do you look at the future of work and some of the issues that have come up with working virtual when you're dealing with a very small business? Mm -hmm. That may be, you know, a family owned business, even a smaller employer. What are your thoughts on this? Well, I think one of the areas that's sort of rife in terms of disability and particularly in the future of work is entrepreneurship. And I think I think the development of, of small companies and with the advent of these sort of platforms, you know, that you can sell direct to consumer or other platforms, you know, like Etsy, for example. So the ability to sort of say, okay, we can take the reins into our own hands and, and guide our future is certainly there. Mm -hmm. But as far as smaller companies, I think that it's still sort of a slow slog at this moment in time. And you know there is the elephant in the room, which is still there, which is the F word, fear. And I think people <laughs> still have that. They're sort of vestiges of the past and that we sort of have to begin to get over. And I go back to this idea that Reid Hoffman has and the idea of the conversation. You know, I, I, as I said before, there is an element of human connection and how we think about connecting with each other and understanding one another. And while some people may think of that as sort of pop psychology, it's so true. And we need to be able to understand relevance. We need to understand value. So I think that's where it begins. And, and I, as I said before, indulge me. The question is often more important than the answer. And you have to begin with the question in order to find the best solution. Okay. 
Um, Betsy, you might have some thoughts on this, but I also want to wrap in maybe one of some of the other questions too, is that, um, you know, when you're working with some of the small companies or the larger companies, um, how do you, there's a question about unconscious bias and how does that fit into the discussion about AI trying to, you know, take that out of the equation? Um, and also someone is asking for some examples of companies that have really done well with inclusive algorithms. Yeah, there are some really good and hard questions in this one. I mean, I think quickly, the smaller companies, you're less likely to run into AI as much right now, right? It's it, it's often been the larger companies because of the volume kind of questions, but it's coming and some smaller companies are using these tools as well. Um, there's also the fact that they may be just using kind of tools that they see as just run of the mill tools that happen to have more and more AI in the back end. So I think, you know, it's coming to smaller companies, even if it's not as as prevalent there today. Um, I think, you know, how do you unconscious bias? Th there was a thought and there are still people who will say that because these are machines, they don't have unconscious bias. But again, all of the data and all of the unconscious bias of the developers is all in there. So, so it's true, it may not be my unconscious bias as a recruiter, but it's certainly the unconscious bias built over many years. And, you know, unconscious bias builds up in some ways just based on our life experience. So if the data represents the life experience of, you know, a bunch of recruiters and a bunch of companies that don't employ people with disabilities, it's still going to come out the same way. Um, and the problem is with, with AI and with most technologies, it then becomes harder to ferret out because you can't just say, oh, you know, Betsy shouldn't really be interviewing that person because of X or, or we should have five people interviewing because of unconscious bias. It's now just this locked in thing that people assume is right. Um, finally, I don't actually know of great examples that have fully... <laughs> address this. Um, I think what's been happening is there's been a lot of identification of the problem. That's good. In the last couple of years, people are starting to go, ooh, yeah, that's not so good. Um, where they've made great strides, I mean, I don't, I don't know of any great big, you know, examples of companies that have beat this down. And again, I think some of it has to do with the data simply aren't there. You know, one of the areas I worry about the most is just people with disabilities have to have a voice and that voice in this case is through data. And I think that's the way we're gonna end it, that people with disability have to have a voice and the voice is gonna be through data. Um, we really thank everybody um, for participating in the webinar. I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions. We can try to answer a few of them, but I think we covered a lot of the major issues that are there. And um, hopefully this is the first for Kessler Foundation doing a virtual symposium, and hopefully we'll be able to offer a number of uh, different ones on, on topics of interest as we go forward uh, next year. So have a good day, everybody, and thank you for joining us. Bye.